Hello everybody, my name is Mervin. I'm product manager here at ClickHouse. I'm, I'm working uh, with the core team uh, specifically. And I've been spending quite a lot of time working and thinking about Data Lake recently. And today I'm going to talk to you about it. And I'm actually going to divide the session into three parts. The first one is our motivation about investing and you know, developing features that help you integrate with your Data Lake. The second part will be about what we have done so far in that space. And the third part, which is actually the most interesting one, so the, the most interesting part will be at the end, will be what's coming next. And you will see that there is a few very interesting features that you have probably never seen before, and that, not, that are not only applicable to Data Lake, but will also be applicable to ClickHouse, generally speaking. If we go back to the history of ClickHouse, ClickHouse was initially developed um, with uh, query latency in mind. And the goal was to make ClickHouse extremely fast on top of very large amount of data, not you know like data that can fit in memory. It was designed to make ClickHouse as fast as possible on terabytes and petabytes of data. So when we developed ClickHouse, uh, a lot of emphasis was put on making sure that we have a strong native format that was designed for performance. And we also developed a bunch of features to make sure that we are supporting low query latency, things like um, materialize you, refreshable materialize you, projections. And that helped a lot improving performance. And we also developed a bunch of data type allowing you to work with your data, things like JSON, for example, and making sure that we have the right data structure to support your workload. And one of the key fundamental uh, features of ClickHouse, given it was developed for web analytics initially, was to make sure that we can also insert a lot of data. Like, uh, we need to have like, a good insert throughput, because in the web analytics space, you insert a lot of data, typically. When we put all that together, the goal was to make ClickHouse as simple as possible to use. So we made sure that ClickHouse was completely self-contained, that you don't have to run around and try to find different software and stitch them together to make it work. With ClickHouse, you take a single binary and you can have your server, your client, your keeper, and everything you need to get started with ClickHouse. And this is with that in mind that we, we developed ClickHouse. But we know that ClickHouse is not only used for, you know, for everything in your company. You probably have a queuing mechanism, right? You might want to integrate with Kafka or with RabbitMQ. You might also have database like uh, MySQL or um, PostgreSQL, right? And you want to integrate with it. And also, you have a data lake. Or maybe all the team in your company have a data lake and wants to integrate with it. And you have iceberg table, parquet, parquet files, or delta lake table somewhere. And you want to be able to use ClickHouse on top of it. And ClickHouse, fundamentally, we developed a bunch of database engine, table functions, table engines that can actually integrate with your ecosystem. And Data Lake is no exception. So when we discuss with the users that are actually using ClickHouse on Iceberg or Delta Lake, often what they will be doing is that they will be using ClickHouse alongside Iceberg, and they will use ClickHouse for their hot layer, right? So ClickHouse was designed for very low query latency, and ClickHouse is being used exactly for that. So people are using ClickHouse when they want to have like real-time analytics dashboard for their customer. But they also want to have a layer that can be used to share data across the, their company or to have like long-term data retention with low storage cost. And they're using Iceberg for that. And typically, the way they are doing it is that they typically do dual rights. So they insert both in ClickHouse and into Iceberg uh, with different TTL policy. And typically, like if you need to have a query on a short time frame, you're going to use ClickHouse. And if you need to query historical data, then you are going to use Iceberg for it. And you can eventually reiterate your data from Iceberg into ClickHouse if need be, if you have like an incident or if you need to do like a security audit or something like that. There's always a way to move data around. So when we talked with our user, we were like thinking, how can we improve our customer experience and our user experience? And interestingly enough, if you look at the history of Iceberg in ClickHouse, it was actually introduced by a community member. Uh, actually, a, a, a software engineer that was using ClickHouse on Iceberg wanted to use ClickHouse with uh, Iceberg, and he actually developed the first table engine for Iceberg. When we thought about that, we were thinking, okay, which feature do we need to develop? And the first one that came in mind were catalog. We need to make sure that if you want to use with Iceberg or Delta Lake, we can actually support your catalog integration. So recently, we, developed, we spent a lot of time working on integrating with Glue, with Polaris, with Unity Catalog, and any catalog you can think of. We even integrate with Hive Metastore um, for some people that are still using it. So now that we have this strong catalog integration, it makes data much more accessible. 
And because people are using ClickHouse, they are expecting speed. So we needed to improve performance. So we added support for partitioning printing, file statistic-based printing, and we improved a lot our caching layer as well. So we store uh, Iceberg and Delta Lake metadata into ClickHouse directly. We can also improve the cache locality for your parquet file in ClickHouse to make sure that we have uh, a good speed even when you are working with data that are external to ClickHouse. And of course, uh, a bulk of the work was to make sure that ClickHouse was compatible with Iceberg specification. And this is where we are spending a lot of time, making sure that we are supporting things like schema evolution, making sure that we can actually do time travel in ClickHouse using Iceberg, and developing all the introspection functions that you need to, to work with your Iceberg table. And we did the same work for Delta Lake. So we started with a catalog uh, integration with Unity, so you can actually query your data in Databricks, for example. Um, but with uh, Delta Lake, one of the main benefits that we, have, we had compared to Iceberg is that De Delta Lake actually provides a library called Delta Kernel, which is a library that helps you understand the Delta protocol. And you, you can abstract it away. You can just provide your reader functions, and the library is going to handle all the parsing of the metadata file for you. Whereas for Iceberg, we had to implement everything from the ground up because apparently they don't have a, a C++ library. So with this Delta kernel implementation, we were able to develop a lot of features on top of Delta Lake, things like partitioning printing, schema evolution, and we're expecting to be able to develop much faster these features than what we did for Iceberg. So this is what we have been doing for the past five to six months. But now the most interesting part arrived because what are we going to do next? So far, we have been focusing mainly on compatibility with Iceberg. And to be honest, that's not the most exciting work, right? We, we just need to make sure that we understand specifications, that we apply them at the ClickHouse level. It's not super thrilling as a task. But now that we are a few pull requests away from being Iceberg v2 compatible, we just need to make sure that once Iceberg v3 is available, we actually can integrate with it and st people start using it. We can support it as well. But we'll be able to start working on more interesting features. Things like performance improvement, for example. And we already started working on a new Parquet reader to improve read on top of Parquet files, but also subsequently to Iceberg and, and Delta uh, tables. So once we have this new Parquet reader, we'll have better performance overall on multiple table formats. But performance improvement is one thing. Like if you look at our GitHub repository, the most requested feature today in ClickHouse repository is actually support for Iceberg writes. So people really want to use ClickHouse to write to their Iceberg table. And this is something that we're going to implement. We are going to start in Q2, and we're going to end it hopefully in Q3. And you will be able to write to Iceberg using ClickHouse. And we'll also do it for Delta Lake. And once you start writing to an Iceberg table, the second thing that you need to do is you need to make sure that you handle all the metadata files and you provide compactions to your users. So we'll also expand this work to compaction, and we'll make a way for a user to use Iceberg in a simple way. So getting started with Iceberg is not easy. Uh, you need to install many different software, and hopefully with the experience that we want with ClickHouse, we want to make this very simple to use Iceberg within ClickHouse. And one of the big tasks that we see our customers struggling with is also how do you load data from an Iceberg table to ClickHouse? And we're going to build a CDC pipeline for it. So basically, you will have a click pipe that can read your Iceberg table and keep it in sync uh, with your ClickHouse table if you want to use it for real-time analytics. But the part I'm the most excited about is really about the opportunity that uh, Iceberg and Delta Lake uh, can give us to push our serverless model a bit more. And all of this work that I'm going to talk to you about is not only applicable to Delta Lake and Iceberg, it's also going to be applicable to the ClickHouse Native format, right? But with Iceberg as a framework, it makes it very easy to do it. Think about Stateless Worker, for example. Imagine a world where you have your ClickHouse cluster, which is running real-time analytics um, with decent memory and CPU usage, uh, and with a very important workload uh, on it. It's powering maybe your customer-facing dashboard. And maybe someone in a different team asks you to run a report on top of an iceberg table, and you don't want to disrupt your cluster and add a surprising workload onto it. And we want to be able to introduce a way for you to actually offload specific queries to a bunch of nodes, ephem ephemeral nodes, nodes that are just spin up to execute a specific query. And once the query is run, just remove this node. And this is a concept of stateless worker, and I'm going to show it to you in a bit. And the second feature we are very excited about is distributed cache. 
when you have separation of compute and storage, one of the main challenge is how do you handle cache, right? Because each one of your compute node is going to have its own cache. And depending on the activity that you are going to have on this compute node, you might have difference in this cache. So some node will have uh, a cache that is optimi optimized for the pattern of queries that they are executing, and some other will have a different type of cache for different type of query. So how can we make this uh, homogeneous across all of your compute node? How can we make the experience of adding new node more seamless? Because uh, when you add a new node to your cluster, we need to, of course, warm up its cache, right? How can we make that simple? And we created a disready cache in our cloud. So it's a service that each compute node in your cluster can connect to and have access to a cache. And that makes that this caching layer is actually shared across all of your compute node. And when you add a new uh, node to your cluster, then this node directly have access to a cache, so no more cold query, or much less cold query. And that's also worked very well with stateless worker, uh, because they can directly connect to your cache and have access to um, populated cache already. And the good news is the work we have been, do been doing on this read cache bear fruits, and we just opened a wait list for this read cache. So if you go to our website, you can actually register to it. You can actually read the blog article that we have wrote about the performance that we've seen on the disparate cache. So stay tuned. We are going to start the private preview very soon. But the feature I want to talk to you about is um, stateless worker. So imagine a world where you have two clusters, right? You have a first cluster, which is a stateful cluster, so it knows about your different table. And then you have a second cluster, which is completely stateless. And the goal is to execute a query on a ClickHouse server and offload it to the pool of stateless worker. So the ClickHouse server don't execute almost anything. So I'm going to run this specific query here, and you can see it's a complex query. It contains joins, it contains aggregation, it contains filtering, and you can see the performance are pretty bad. It took 90 seconds to execute this query, even though it was on a very large data volume. Now let's look at the resource usage of this specific query. You can see that on the left column, this is a ClickHouse server. Uh, you can see there is a spike in memory usage and CPU usage. Whereas for the stateless worker, you can see the graph are relatively flat, meaning that most of the work was done by the ClickHouse server, which was not our goal. Why? Well, because the way we are distributing query using iceberg cluster type of function in ClickHouse is that we are distributing reads, right? So each stateless worker will actually help you read the different parquet files and doing basic filtering and basic group by, but most of the heavy lifting still needs to be done on the coordinating node. So we sit down with the engineering team and we thought about how can we make stateless worker even more efficient. And it means that we had to revisit the way we are distributing query in ClickHouse and we introduced the concept of data shuffling. So what I'm going to show you is actually a prototype of the work we have been doing, and you can see that it's a prototype by the 20 settings that we had to tune um, at the end of the query. And the good thing is that it's work. Like this data shuffling approach makes the performance of the query much better. You can see that it took 15 seconds this time using data shuffling. And now when we are actually using, uh, looking at the resource used by the different server, you can see that the ClickHouse server has been chilling. It's relatively flat. And this is exactly what we wanted, whereas most of the work was done by the stateless worker, which is great. So all of that is a prototype but it's uh, something that we will be able to test in the, in the near future as well with uh, a few customers. So that's the end of my demo. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. If you have any question about this read cache, stateless worker, iceberg, or ClickHouse, you can find me at the AMA booth. Thank you very much for your attention, everybody.